Okay, wait, wait, he's coming, he's coming. Make sure it off. How much money do you have? $30,000 in one month, Jordy? Huh? Down to my last 97. $26,000 for one dinner. $197 million. It goes without saying that there's nothing money can't buy. Yet yeah. all you philosophy graduates can present me with a million theories, but the fact remains that even your degrees costed you some dough, right? There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor, and if the billionaires and millionaires of the world are any example to go by, then I'm speaking the god honest truth. Because I'm the whole company. Yeah, I think you're gonna stick around because I'm gonna stuff your mouth with so much money you're gonna gold figurines. That's exactly why the TV region wants to celebrate richness today by giving you the top 25 times when characters flex their money across films and TV. Switzerland. We got a couple mil coming in like a week. When it gets here, I'll give you a call and you'll come pick it up. Sweetheart, you have my money taped to you. Okay, technically you do work for me. When it comes to ridiculously abusing your cash, there aren't too many moves that supersede the Wolf of Wall Street. Look what I found in my pocket! Look, a year's salary right here! Fun coupons! This film is said to be Martin Scorsese's most casually brilliant effort in terms of R-rated magnificence, and you know what, I totally agree with that. Whether it's the constant F-bombs or the reason every man fell in love with Margot Robbie, this film has it all. Understand how much, how much money you made? I don't know, 70,000 last month? Well, technically, 72,000 last month, something like that. No, seriously, dudes were going gaga over Naomi the same way everyone's obsessed with a hot talk girl today. Okay, let's move to the scene that actually involves money. It's when Brad and his girlfriend are conspiring with Jordan and Donnie to smuggle cash across the borders. All seems to be going well, but then Donnie reveals that Jordan's not the only one with a load of dough. He's got a couple of million coming in as well, which means that Brad and his girl work for him as well. It's a completely sudden realization for the characters and even the audience as they realize that Leonardo DiCaprio isn't the only money maker in this film. Man, the way Jonah Hill pulls off this dialogue, it almost feels as if he's some kind of rapper making money moves. Obviously not the Drake kind though, because that man's just getting cooked over and over again by Kendrick Lamar. $22 million in three hours! Hey, Lawrence, sorry the uh, other offer fell through. The number is 140, cash with a stock alternative. Well, that is an appealing package. You better play nice though, because I'm the whole company. I'm gonna lock you in a golden cage, pay you so much, you sing whatever song I want. Ah, now this is a show I really need to be talking about more. It's got the ruthlessness of the business world coupled with the satire needed to provide comic relief at regular intervals. Now, we all know that the show is roughly modeled after the Fox Empire, but of course, you need to impress audiences to keep going after your pilot episode. Enter Kendall Roy, a man who loves golden cages and silver, um... I'm gonna lock you in a golden cage. Uh, you with a silver... Uh, let's call them toys. This is basically the scene where he meets with Lawrence to get his company Volta under his own umbrella. Despite Lawrence trying to act tough, Kendall knows the deal with people like him when it comes to money. That's when he delivers an epic line where he talks about shoving so much money down Lawrence's throat that he might end up with a new kink. That is an appealing package. It is, yeah. It's appealing. Anyway, the point here is that the scene showcases Kendall to be a brutal operator, even though his efforts to look cool may at best be described as cringe. He knows how to crack a deal and also intimidate the other party while doing it. Here's where I'm at. We're not crazy about how your father has treated our relationship. Oh, come on, man. F*** off. The most important thing I learned from this show, though, was that Kendall could be a dude's name as well. Until then, I could only see Kendall Jenner in my mind whenever I'd hear that name. Okay, maybe that was too much info. Do you want to call your dad? Do I want to call my dad? No, I don't want to call my dad. Do you want to call your dad? Does anybody want to call their dad? Okay, nobody wants to talk to their dad. I were to offer you $1 million for one night with your wife. I'd assume you're kidding. Let's pretend I'm not. He'd tell you to go to hell. I didn't hear him. Billionaires and millionaires really have no respect for money when they want to flaunt it. They can go to any extent when it comes to blowing the big bucks, as long as it means they get to prove a point. Take 1993's indecent proposal as an example. Billionaire John Gage can have literally anything he wants, and yet he wants to challenge the loyalty of a seemingly happy married couple. Diana and David have been facing their own financial struggles, and John can see that very easily. Here you are, Mr. G, one million dollars. Bet it all. What he can also see is that Diana is fine AF. You're a lucky man, because I got money, I got security, I have businesses, but you have something that I just don't have. Which kind of raises the question as to why she's with a loser like David in the first place. 
All he's got to do is offer a whopping $1 million for a night with Diana, and the sanctity of marriage crumbles just like that. He'd tell you to go to hell. I didn't hear him. I'd tell you to go to hell. David, I think you want me to do it. Why do you want to do it? I do it for you. Look, I know certain feminists had a problem with this movie because it's basically showing that women will do anything for money. But hey, just look at the social climate today and tell me if that isn't the case. The movie's no masterpiece, but John flexing his cash in the most dominating way possible has got to be a top tier display. Also, I know that Demi Moore was an absolute babe during her time, but sheesh, a million dollars for one night with her had to be super generous. I am very happy. She is the best, absolutely. You said I'm the best of them? I don't understand. She's the best of the Million Dollar Club. Million Dollar Club. Now you've got it. There was nothing to have. People were going to provide their own pictures, their own information. But at the moment, I could buy Mount Auburn Street, take the Phoenix Club, and turn it into my ping pong. Damn, I know that Mark Zuckerberg has been the subject of endless controversies over his lifetime, but damn, he really flexes a ton of sass and cash in 2010's The Social Network. We all know about the legal hassles that the Facebook founder had to face over the conception of his company, but man, David Fincher really gave it life in this film. Then why didn't you raise any of these concerns before? That's right. Do you think I deserve your full attention? Tried, but there's no requirement that I enjoy sitting here listening to people lie. You have part of my attention. You have the minimum amount. Just look at the confrontations Mark has with his two main competing parties. Like, when he's up against Eduardo, Mark openly mocks him by talking about how he could buy Mount Dobrin Street and the Phoenix and turn them into his ping pong room if he wanted to. Man, that's super savage and also a slap to the face of an Andrew Garfield who's only going to have it a lot worse four years later when he loses Gwen Stacy. Then of course we have the encounter against the Winklevoss twins where Mark openly insults them by saying that they would have actually owned Facebook if they had truly owned it. But bro held nothing back here and made sure his opponents knew of his standing right then. It's the first time I've seen a nerd flex so hard that he renders the whole room silent. If you guys were the inventors of Facebook, you have invented Facebook. Is an embalming knife from the tomb of King Balassi of Sumeria. Three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand dollars. And one cent. Five hundred thousand. Wow, Miss Keen, that's a lot of money for someone like you. Two million dollars! Sold to Mr. Bruce Wayne! <laughs> Man, this is the kind of Bruce Wayne I can totally watch a whole TV show on. Huh, wait, that's exactly what Gotham is about, isn't it? This is probably the most famous scene from the entire series as Batman, in a younger, brattier body, takes on Barbara Keane in a bidding war for a knife that's around 2,000 years old. What starts off as friendly banter eventually turns into an all-out battle, although it's mere fun and games for the Dark Knight. With Bruce only bidding a dollar or a cent more than Barbara in the initial rounds, we have $200,000. 200000 and one dollar. You'd imagine it was never his intention to consider her a formidable opponent. Of course, Barbara didn't like that one bit, so she tried to flex her wealth by raising her bid from three to five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand. Now back off, you little brat. What she shouldn't have done, though, was call Bruce a brat, because he then proceeds to violate her in the most savage way possible. To tell someone she's bidding a lot of money considering her own financial status is probably a worse burn than Superman's laser eyes. Wow, Miss Keen. A lot of money for someone like you. But then Bruce takes the flexing to a whole other level by straight up bidding two million dollars for the knife and winning it by a landslide. Man, his ego must have been on a whole other level after pulling this off. And considering he's just a kid, it only goes to show how badass Mr. Wayne has been right from the very start. I don't care how much money you have. You're a dork and a freak, Wayne. Wait, who's Bruce talking to? Uh, not him. Let me talk to the owner. You're standing next to him. I bought the place. Pablo Escobar has often been showcased as this evil drug lord who took several lives in his quest to become the richest man in the world. Well, that is true because he was definitely a ruthless man, but he still cared for his family as can be seen here in Narcos. His poor little daughter is freezing, but there's no wood, so what do you do? Well, if you're Pablo, then you take out $2 million in cash and straight up burn it for warmth. Yeah, the same amount of money that Bruce Wayne bid for a knife has been burnt away just to keep a little girl warm. I mean, both acts are serious flexes, but you've got to give it to Pablo for being a good dad when it mattered. Si vos seguís comprando así, vas a aparecer en la revista Forbes. ¿Qué quiere que le diga? Entiérrela. Entiérrela plata. And that's what they did. They buried it in fields. 
Well, actually, it would have mattered a lot more if he'd led an honest life and raised his family without any legal troubles following them around the entire time, but I guess you've got to pick your battles, eh? Either way, giving up two million like this was a boss-level move, and if there's one person who's going to be proud of him for helping his family, it's definitely the Fast and Furious Vin Diesel. And by the time you were 28 years old, you have so much money you can't even count it. You make your dreams come true. We have to get back to my lab and use a satellite to scan the Earth for thermal anomalies. You have a satellite? I have six. Batman strikes yet again and expect to see more of him because he's easily DC's top boy when it comes to flexing cash. How did you get the house back from the bank? I bought the bank. This scene is from the Snyder Cut of the Justice League where Batman, The Flash and Cyborg discuss scanning the Earth for thermal anomalies to try and figure out how to stop Steppenwolf. Now, Cyborg obviously has his own tech to help him out, but Bruce Wayne wants to be helpful as well. So he offers using his satellites for a quicker job. Naturally, Barry Allen expresses surprise over the fact that Batman owns a satellite, but then he does in one better and reveals that he actually owns six of them. Yeah, I don't think anyone knows how to respond to such a statement like that, and The Flash's reaction was as a appropriate as it could get. Cyborg's response was pretty meh, but then again, this dude is 90% robot, so I'm gonna let that one slide. But seriously, this revelation should be opening up all kinds of conspiracy theories around the Dark Knight. Like, what on earth is a billionaire doing with six satellites? That's enough to control a whole news channel all by yourself. I guess even Bruce Wayne is no exception to the concept of controlling narratives with money. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. Have you left it? I got it. No, it's okay. We got in there, cinder blocks. Half a million in cash. <laughs> One of the most messed up mistakes ever made by a cop would have to be Hank Schrader not giving Walter White enough credit. If he treated Walt as a normal dude, he would have probably caught on to the signs a lot quicker, such as when he openly tells him that he has half a million dollars in cash in one of his bags. Like, dude, the moment I saw that happen, I was wondering if Walt did this intentionally to probably get caught so that he wouldn't have to make meth anymore. However, it was pretty much a flex of two kinds. The first is to the audience, telling us that he can freely roam around with that amount of cash without getting caught. The second is also to the audience, letting us know that he's such a crafty operator as he can get away with even a cop standing right in front of him with evidence in his hand and a confession in his ears. Man, this was a Giga Chad move, and Hank must have been regretting it when he eventually found out the truth in that toilet. Yeah, dude, the sussy barker was your brother-in-law the whole time. I have so much cash on hand that I actually counted by weighing it on my bathroom scale. $30,000 in one month, Jordy? Huh? $26,000 for one dinner. Me, though, and explain this shit to him. Right, this is all the f***ing charges right here. It's a known fact that all wealthy businessmen pay most of their bills through the company. It's a smart move, too. You can show your personal expenses as business expenses and pay lesser taxes. However, sometimes when you're making a bit too much money, you tend to get carried away and spend $30,000 all within a single month. Just like Jordan Belfort and his buddies did in The Wolf of Wall Street. Yes, I can understand why his dad would be mad here, and he only makes it funnier when he reveals that 26,000 of those dollars were spent only for one f***ing dinner. Like, damn, was the restaurant selling houses that day? The best part of the scene is where Leonardo says that it was mainly because of Donnie ordering sides, and then Donnie says that they were so good that they could cure cancer. Worth the sides, so sides, yeah. sides, twenty-six thousand dollars yeah. worth of sides. Cure cancer. That's the problem. They were there. That's why they were expensive. <laughs> Shut the f up. I mentioned in my earlier entry that this movie shows a ridiculous abuse of money. But of all the d one that is my absolute favorite, and I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about this. And that's exactly what we have on display here. Also, I need to remind you that his expenditure was from the 1990s era, when a dollar could get you a heck lot more than what it can get today. It's also kind of crazy to imagine that the real Jordan Belfort must have done this kind of stuff in real life too. You finally found a broker on Wall Street who can consistently make money. I guess I'm pretty impressed. 
How much money do you have? Babe. 197 million. Brian Cranston was on the delivering side of this flex earlier, and now he finds himself on the receiving side as he tries to convince his daughter not to get married to James Franco. Well, that's actually a reasonable thing in the real world, but in 2016's Why Him? It's a whole other story. Laird Mayhew has been making big moves in Silicon Valley, which leads him to a super wealthy net worth. Steffi says that you're pretty serious about your bowling, so... Fixing a crack in the foundation. <laughs> Is that us? However, Ned doesn't want his daughter Stephanie to tie the knot with Laird because he finds him a bit too immature. <laughs> the concerned dad finds a way to sway Stephanie away by exploring Laird's accounts, which are in the negative. However, Gustav reveals that Laird actually has it good when it comes to his personal account. Of course, the man himself doesn't think it's much because he says that he's down to his last $197 million. Like, what does that even mean? How much did you even have before? And why is it a bad thing to have that much dough? Man, I'll never understand millionaires. But yeah, when it comes to the flex, the look on Ned's face is more than enough to communicate what has been dealt to him. Yeah, his daughter ain't gonna leave his opponent anytime soon. So this is for you. What is it? Phone? Press the button. This is from my bank in Grand Rapids. Merry Christmas. Fox. I seem to remember firing you. I got another job. Yours. What makes you think you can decide who's running Wayne Enterprises? Well, the fact that I'm the owner. I bought most of the shares. Never mess with Batman, even if you try to give the public access to his company. William Earl learned that the hard way when he saw Fox hosting the board meeting that he was technically supposed to be in charge of. However, what the poor schmuck didn't realize is that Fox now has his job and Bruce Wayne has brought the majority of Wayne Enterprises through his various charitable foundations and whatnot. Through various charitable foundations and trusts and so forth. The way this scene is constructed goes to show why Christopher Nolan is an absolute master of his craft. We all somewhat knew what the reason was for this, but to see it unfold in front of our eyes in a perfectly paced manner totally enhances the scene, as well as Bruce's flex. Didn't you get the memo? Sure, we all know he's rich enough to buy his own company, but to violate Earl the way he did takes an added dose of class and savagery that money simply can't buy. You can sense the condescending tone while Bruce speaks to Earl over the phone. It's a total boss move because you can see the clear difference in their leagues. I'll get my car. I brought mine. Yours. Yeah, Christian Bale definitely tapped into his Patrick Bateman energy to deliver this performance. Nice car. Well, it looks like we've got ourselves a fast and furious entry after all. Although it doesn't have anything to do with the ridiculous amount of money that this ridiculous franchise has made. It doesn't even feature Dom or Brian as we get the most hilarious duo of the series flexing on each other. Roman Pierce and Tej Parker are definitely bros for life, and that vibe's shown perfectly here when Roman shows Tej the new car he's got. It's supposed to be the only one in the Western Hemisphere as Roman tries to act like Vito Corleone by saying he made a shaken offer he couldn't refuse. Well, Tej doubles the flex right after by revealing that he's got one as well, so there are technically two such cars in the Western Hemisphere now. I also got to shout out those fine ladies as well. Sometimes you just got to have two gorgeous women waiting in your hypercar just around the corner out of sight for moments like these. The W goes to Tedge for this play, but that doesn't change the fact that both these dudes are now playing with serious dough. I guess they deserved it after pulling off that ridiculous heist with a gigantic save. Okay, I'll do No way. No, 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 not in this. I guess that means there are two in the Western Hemisphere, huh? I'm only ruining my half. This town deserves a better class of criminal. Imagine sitting on a huge pile of cash only to burn it away seconds later without batting an eyelid or even having a single shred of regret. This is one of the many reasons why the Dark Knight's Joker will always remain the best comic book villain to have ever graced the screens. This scene proves that he's indeed a better class of criminal because he doesn't care about any amount of cash in the world. All he wants to do is send a message and effect change from within. The fact that he mentions he's only burning his half further drives the point that he really couldn't care less about what happens to his financial status. 
And that, my friends, is how a real villain flexes. Plus, Bro says the gas is cheap in this scene. Watching this scene in 2024 really makes me crave for a time machine to take me back to the good old days. Another thing I'd like to point out is that by burning all this cash, Joker could have taken down the inflation rate as well. Now, wouldn't that have made him the good guy? Gasoline. They're cheap. Tell your men they work for me now. This is my city. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. I don't know what you did. I did a mistake, that's all. How did you get the house back from the bank? I bought the bank. Behind every wealthy billionaire is a group of family members and friends that he would always like to help. Bruce Wayne is one such case as he's ready to pull out all the stops necessary to help Superman get back his home. It's a sincere effort from a friend and it really speaks well of Bruce's soft persona when he's not being Batman. It also reveals how rich he is because the man literally bought the bank to get the seized house back. He says it so casually as well when Clark Kent asks him how he did it. I don't think it's as simple as writing out a check to the bank's owners, but hey, it is Batman, he can freaking do anything. Also, I'm sure that Bruce must have been feeling a bit guilty about attacking Superman back in 2016 when he should have been focusing on evil Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, Lex Luthor, okay? Well, if Bruce ever wants to do someone else a favor by buying them a house, you know where to reach me, don't you? I did a mistake, that's all. Congratulations, by the way. Ted solo nos da 150 mil. Así que acepta mi oferta o acepta las consecuencias. Pablo Escobar makes headlines again, and the reason this entry is higher despite a lower amount of money being burnt is because of the implication. It's basically when he deals with a DAS agent who seems to know a lot about his market prices. If you're smart enough to run a multi-billion dollar drug empire, then you're also smart enough to know when you have a mole in your operation. The only way that agent could have gained access to such important information was through an inside source because Pablo knows how to keep a tight lid on his operations. As expected, he offered the million dollars as if it's nothing, but wanted the name in exchange. His business sense is on display yet again when he tells the cop that if he gives the name, then he won't have to split the cash with his informant. The flex is of a psychological nature, because by doing this, he's enabling the cop to act dirty as well. See, this is what happens when you deal with an alpha male. Sure, he's doing illegal stuff, but he's also testing those who claim not to be corrupt. Yeah, I know he actually ends up taking the life of the cop later on as well, so he didn't have to spend anything, but the point does still stand. Plus, it's not like a million dollars would have hurt his pocket. I literally just mentioned how twice that amount meant nothing to him a few entries ago. Te voy a dar un millón de dólares. Cántele un nombre y no va a tener que dividir ese billete. Use our footage, keyword cult. How quickly can we drive this building? Yeah, my top 10 is just about to kick off with the MCU's most iconic billionaire. And this scene encapsulates how much money actually means to him. This is towards the end of the epic Hulkbuster fight where Iron Man tries to finish off the Hulk by smashing him through a building. The only thing is that the building in itself must have costed a lot of money to make and he wouldn't want all that effort to go to waste. That's why good guy Tony Starks makes sure to purchase the whole thing right before he totally annihilates it in all of five business seconds. See, this is what I like to call an ethical billionaire. Maybe Taylor Swift can learn a thing or two from him. Also, just look at how casually he asks how quickly he can purchase the building as if he's buying some ice cream for his daughter on the way home. I'm sure the figure would have easily been around $10 million at the very least, so yeah, if this ain't a casual flex, then I don't know what is. Bouncer's acting like he doesn't know who I am. He knows who you are. He just doesn't care. Season 4 of Gotham really brought out the money flexing capabilities in Bruce Wayne, didn't it? First, he humiliates Barbara at the knife auction. Now he's throwing Brant out of a club he impulsively bought just to do that. 
Yeah, I aspire to be as rich as a guy who casually buys a whole club just to troll his hater. This really is Batman's superpower, isn't it? Like, not only does he make a statement in front of Brandt, he also goes to show off in front of Grace and the other girls. Yeah, this is how you can riz up the ladies while taking down the competition at the same time. Now, on a more serious note, was buying the club a profitable choice? I mean, these places usually have high risks attached to them, but the money comes in good. After all, it was doing so well after that bouncer was refusing entry to people. But yeah, the moment when Brandt learns that Bruce is the new owner of the club, the look on his face was absolutely priceless. Uh, not him. Let me talk to the owner. You're standing next to him. About the place. I do not like you very much. And I do not like your politics. Hmm. I could go to 25. Succession really is a gem of a series, especially if you consider the first two seasons. Now, the negotiations between Logan Roy and Pierce Media was an interesting one because it highlights the true nature behind such deals. Of course, Nan wants to act high and mighty with her morals, but she shows her honest self the moment Logan raises the acquisition price to $25 billion. Which brings me to the flex. $25 billion being mentioned so casually is not normal human behavior. Then, when Nan tries to act smart, Logan reminds her that she isn't the one with an offer, it's him. He also says that he's just put a price on Pierce Media even though Nan was trying to say that her company couldn't be valued by numbers. This is some S-tier negotiation at work, but it falls apart when Nan tries to dictate the succession of the company. That's where this scene becomes a real masterpiece. Logan is desperate for the deal to materialize and yet he refuses to be cornered. That's what makes him what he is, strong, ruthless, fierce, respected, and successful. Oh yeah, and the take the money line is indeed from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, just as Logan mentioned, although without his F-bomb. You can't put a value on what we do. I have put a value on what you do. Then I'm afraid we have no deal. Take the money. Yeah, Bruce, fancy that. So let's put a couple tables together. I'm not sure that they'll let us. Oh, they should. I own the place. Bruce Wayne told that random dude to check out his other car in Batman Begins. Yeah, that's the same kind of energy he pulls here when he gets a new girl to replace Rachel and brings her over to join Harvey and his ex. Some of you might call it petty, but I'll call it a flex because not only does he rub it into Harvey's face that he owns the hotel, he also tells him that he's going to throw him a fundraiser to help him run his agendas. The fact that he almost forces it onto Harvey by telling him about how a fundraiser with his pals will sort him out for life totally showcases the dominance that comes with being a wealthy man. Of course, of course, this is also to remind Rachel that she's missing out on a lot of luxurious experiences. But then again, some self-righteous genius is going to say that she wouldn't sell out for money. Well, here's a newsflash for you. She ends up cheating on Harvey with the same billionaire who was flexing his cash. I don't blame her though. Heck, even I'd date Bruce Wayne if he got me some nice things. Well, I'm sold. I'm going to throw you a fundraiser. That's nice of you, Bruce. One fundraiser with my pal. You'll never need another set. I will see thy honest fear, stupid name, by the way. With $250 million, I can pull the plug at any time. That's the deal. No negotiation. Yeah, when we talk about power players making money moves in the world of television, you can't ignore Bobby Axelrod from Billions. Agreed, the show has been on a bit of a downward spiral after including a bit of woke nonsense, but a lot of that has also to do with the fact that Bobby was gone for a while. Make no mistake, he's the one who runs the show quite literally, and we see a glimpse of that caliber in the Ion Sphere deal. The way he strong arms Channing and the others with a massive $250 million is a work of art. The terms Bobby asked for are pretty rough, with a 40% revenue share to go with full transparency transparency and fund management limitations, but even so, he knows Ion Sphere has no other option and that's exactly why he wins this negotiation with minimum effort. Now that's how you own the competition. You'll be required to sign non-compete and non-solicitation agreements. Why don't we call it 40? 40? You will provide total transparency. On a daily basis, I consume enough drugs to sedate Manhattan and Queens for a month. Enough of this will make you invincible. Conquer the world. Yep, this movie's taken over this video and for all the good reasons. Jordan Belfort has always been about the money, and we get a great demonstration of his persona when Leonardo DiCaprio walks us through his ridiculous wealth. The flexing is constant right until he tells us that the most powerful drug in the world 
is money. Yeah, he's always wanted to be rich and it's that same attitude that has brought him to such heights. This is the perfect intro to a man who dreamed and achieved, although yes, he does fall in the middle as well. With everything said and done though, at least he's lived the kind of life that a vast majority of this world would never be able to. Damn. That was a bit savage of me, wasn't it? Pot to mellow me out, cocaine to wake me back up again, and morphine well, because it's awesome. And I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about this. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. Imagine The Flash asking you about your superpower and you reply with, I'm rich. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of flex you'd expect from someone like Bruce Wayne, who's completely owned this list with multiple entries across multiple movies. Of course, the reason this one stands out is because it communicates a rather simple fact with such precision and sass that it leaves us all speechless. But he is speaking the truth, you know. Being rich is the best superpower to have in this world, especially the current one. He talks the talk too, because that car he's driving is probably worth more than what most people would make their whole life. Who is it you think you see? Do you know how much I make a year? A business big enough that it could be listed on the NASDAQ goes belly up. Disappears. Walter White is the ultimate badass when it comes to characters who have gone from zero to 100 real quick. Yeah, it feels kind of weird quoting a Drake lyric, but the logic holds true. This iconic speech to Skyler is proof of that. Sure, all of us hate Skyler with a burning passion, but I suppose she's showing some kind of concern here, so we shouldn't really be that mad at her. Having said that, I want to point out that Walter asking her if she knew how much money he made was a beautiful retort. Talking about his drug trade, which is big enough to be listed on the stock exchange, totally gave us a fresh perspective on the financial success Heisenberg has enjoyed. And of course, it goes without saying that he is the one who knocks. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. I am the one who knocks. Environment, attention, no surprises. Ow! Are you nuts? Sure, Sam. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy. We haven't seen a lot of Tony Stark in this list, but that doesn't mean he isn't one of the most sassiest billionaires in film history. The number two spot belongs to him because he's a genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist, quite literally too. This line had everyone going crazy, and if Scarlett Johansson is giving you the nod, then you're definitely not messing around. This one statement put Captain America in his place because it's true, and even though Steve Rogers tried a lame comeback, nobody remembers it, and for good reason. Only winners remain in our minds, not losers. Okay, this is the second time I've flexed myself. Maybe these videos are finally starting to get to me. I know guys with none of that worth 10 years. You know, you may not be a threat, but you better stop pretending to be here. The pool is for decoration, and your friends do not have to. We're well, buying this hotel, and uh, setting some new rules about the pool area. This is a well-deserved spot because Bruce Wayne has been an absolute star throughout this video. The scene from Batman Begins perfectly proves why he deserves the top rank here as he instinctively buys a whole damn hotel just so that his pretty European lady friends can enjoy themselves by the fountain. Man, this is the kind of lifestyle not just me, but hundreds of millions of people out there would love to live. The way Bruce owns that hotel manager with one simple line goes on to show you don't need to put on a cape and beat up people to exert your dominance over them. So yeah, Bruce Wayne is our undisputed flex king when it comes to money. Nice car. Should have seen another one. Huh? Well, the guy dresses up like a bat. Clearly has issues. Hope you liked the video. Please subscribe to the TV region, and here's another video that I know you're going to enjoy.